Let's make a start. Hello, welcome everybody to today's uh, Exxon Network Plus seminar. Um, my name is John Rose Adams. I work at the University of York and I'm um, part of the Exxon Network Plus project. Um, today, we've got two projects, both led by London College of Fashion at the University of the Arts London, um, exploring different aspects of culture and fashion and their intersections with immersive and interactive technologies. Um, um, I'm gonna quickly, Oh no, I'm not going to share my slide now. I'm, I'm going to, just a quick note about what XR Network Plus is in case it's unfamiliar to you. So it's a, a project, uh, its full name is Virtual Production in the Digital Economy and it provides funding and support to researchers working in virtual production technologies and it facilitates collaboration between academia and industry nationally interna and internationally. Um, it's funded by the uh, Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, EPSRC, and it's led by the University of York uh, in collaboration with the Univers University of Edinburgh, um, the University of the Arts London, Cardiff University and Ulster University. Um, I'm gonna, a little note on the format for today's seminar. So we'll welcome our first speakers, um, Lisa and Nina, who will speak for about 20 minutes, followed by 10 minutes question and discussion. And then we'll welcome Donatella and Ben, our second set of speakers who will again speak for 20 minutes around that with 10 minutes of discussion. So it should, be, it should be done by about an hour's time. Um, during the discussion piece parts, we're gonna do something slightly different to what we've normally done. Um, so if you wanna ask a question or make a comment, there's a Q and A box, which you can make use of. Um, but uh, also if you uh, want to talk um, and ask your question verbally, then um, you can, in the discussion section, if you raise your hand, there should be a raise hand button somewhere. You should be able to see checking we can see it, um, then uh, we can um, uh, enable the audio and you'll be able to ask a question directly. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm gonna be back between the speakers to help um, marshal the conversations and pick up the questions um, with my colleague, Dan, and also be back at the end for some parish notices. But first off, um, I'd like to welcome uh, Lisa and Nina from London College of Fashion. Uh, who are going to introduce themselves and talk about their project. So over to you both. Great. Thank you, John. Thanks so much. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm Dr. Nina van Valkenburg, and I am joined with Lisa Chatterton from the Fashion Innovation Agency. And um, we are going to just spend the next 10, 15, 20 minutes diving into our research that we conducted this year on digital materialism and specifically how Gen Zs are building pathways to XR and VP acceptance. So before I go into those findings and more onto that context, um, I'm going to hand it over to Lisa to give a little bit of context about what the FIA does. And I'm going to share my screen. So hopefully this works. Bear with me. Perfect. Can you see that? Lisa? I'm going to just see if I can make it full screen as well. One moment. Um, da, 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 da. One second, sorry. Is, does that work, Lisa? Can you see that? Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Nina. So to introduce Fashion Innovation Agency, we're a specialist team, uh, part of London College of Fashion. And we are on a mission to demonstrate to the fashion industry um, how they can use emerging technologies to change the way that they make product, showcase product and sell product. Next slide, please, Nina. Thank you. So next slide. So over the past 10 years, we've been really fortunate to work with some amazing brands um, on these innovative projects. And so I'm just gonna give you a, a snapshot now on some of these um, to give you a, a flavor of, of the things we've been working on. So we were realized very early on that we were looking at how we could blend the physical with the digital. And we partnered with pioneers um, in visual effects, ILM X Lab, part of Lucasfilm. And we basically wanted to look at how we could show real time uh, digital augmentations at Fashion Week. 
So to do this, we hijacked uh, a designer's show. So Stephen Ty, um, we first of all augmented the environment and over a period of 30 minutes, uh, we took the audience uh, from, down, from Whitehall to downtown Macau and the jungle. And we had an audience of a thousand people. And what we noticed was the dwell time increased from an average of 10 minutes to 30 minutes. Next slide. We also uh, created di digital replicas of garments within Stephen's collection. And we had a motion capture performer driving the digital performance of this avatar. And what was really interesting was to see this integration of the physical and the digital. So then we've been exploring real-time cloth simulation. And we've been looking at, um, with the advances, advances in technology, we've been looking at how we can create really realistic movements from the garments. So this is a little video here on the screen. So you can see the motion capture suit driving the avatar and the cloth deformation on the garments um, getting better and better. So next slide. So then we took this technology um, to a location in central London and we deployed markerless motion capture so that we could have a performer um, driving the performance of the avatar on these huge 50 foot screens um, at the outernet. And this is really exciting to see how these immersive technologies can be used um, in the public realm without the need for headsets. So really cool to see these things uh, for fashion presentations. So then this next um, presentation is just to demonstrate how we've been using um, immersive technologies for XR collaboration. So during COVID, we were able to um, join uh, to collaborate remotely through virtual reality on directing a, a fashion shoot. And then the next slide just demonstrates how we've been uh, working with technologies like volumetric capture, so 3D video, where we can create 3D models of garments with um, real, real accurate kind of demonstrations of the moving fabrications. And then we're able to put these um, experiences into different formats. So in this instance, uh, Microsoft's mixed reality headset, the HoloLens. And so for the XR Network Plus project, we were re really building on that um, to look at how audiences can um, engage with different levels of immersion. And then lastly, this project on the screen right now is just to illustrate how we've been using artificial intelligence. So all of our projects that we've, I've shown you are all underpinned by AI, and we've been working with AI for the last five years. So this is a more recent project where we were taking LCF archive footage, and then we were creating entirely new generative AI content to create new models, garments, and environments. So we're really excited to see how that develops over the coming months. So now I'm going to hand over to Nina, and Nina's going to talk you through our XR Network Plus project. Can everyone see that okay? Great, perfect. Um, so just a little bit of context here um, and, and building off of what Lisa was saying. I mean, the FIA does some incredible work um, kind of bridging that academia with, with industry and you know, has so much kind of capability in the tech space. And my background, um, I am 
I, I lead the master's in marketing program at LCF and I'm an ethnographer by training. So what excites me about this space is, is the storytelling and how, you know, we as humans interact in these, with these technologies, you know, what are the barriers, what are the drivers that encourage us to get involved um, with XR from a, from a consumer point of view in particular. So for our project here, um, we basically came together and we said, look, the technology is here. You know, there is a demand here. You know, the market is growing, especially in the digital clothing space. Um, but one problem that we're having is, is why is in particular Gen Zs, you know, who are very, you know, have so much tech acumen, you know, are so creative. Why is there still you know, almost almost this gap of actually, you know, adopting these technologies in the everyday, especially from a fashion and, and retail space. So how can we overcome that low interaction, really spark more engagement in this space? Um, and previously, from a research perspective, um, there have been some, some kind of negative consequences um, on, on using some of the technologies, you know, in, in VR, for example. So thinking about kind of physical discomfort, et cetera. So we wanted to go deeper into that and understand more about this experience. And so our research here was um, based off of observation. And, and focus groups and to go beyond the statistics that we oftentimes see in papers and, um, and in the press. Um, and again, with the context, you know, this, as, as we all know in this space, and you know, there's this is nothing necessarily new. Um, brands have been um, experimenting with, with different forms of XR, um, especially, you know, kind of post-COVID. Um, there's been much more um, interest in this space. And so from what we're hearing from kind of household brands, um, whether it's luxury or a high street, um, they just want to understand, you know, what is the consumer today looking for? How can we we make these these stories that we're involved in how can we make it relevant to different parts of the market and so um, our starting point here um, with this particular XR network project was again to understand these drivers and barriers of Gen Zs to adopt and proactively interact with different forms of XR experiences um, so um, understanding more again about these attitudes and and the behaviors. And so um, I'll give a bit of detail as to how we did this, but we were very lucky to work with a brilliant industry partner, um, MXR, who are very much leaders in the 3D material capture space. And their overall mission is to really kind of democratize and enable um, creators from, from all industries um, to better um, you know, capture and create these 3D assets. And as you can see here, you know, that the materials, the actual um, images that we see here are are, are so realistic and they came into this project wanting to understand okay we have some the great technology here we've got you know a high sense of realism but does that actually impact this overall experience from a gen z audience for example um, so we worked closely with them in terms of actually creating the 3D assets um, these are a couple of images um, that our creative technologist Costas was working on and, and created um, and again, what I mentioned earlier, this was completely based off of ethnographic research. Um, so we spend more various days in our uh, FIA lab at the LCF campus, um, understanding how Gen Zs interact with VR, MR, AR, um, and to go kind of deep into their experiences. Um, I'm not going to play all of the videos just because of the kind of time, but this is just an example of the kind of mixed reality experience here. Um, this is in the FIA office. Um, Lisa is in the background, I can see. Um, but this is, again, one example of MR and, um, and, and that asset was then kind of translated in different XR forms as well. Um, oh, just kind of, there we are. Um, then again, here are some examples of our assets. Um, so we had handbags. You can see kind of the, le the, the level of um, realism with the different textiles and cool shorts that we created, handbags and jackets as well. 
And here is a snapshot from our actual testing day. Um, so again, as I work with students every day, um, I had a whole kind of pool of, of excited Gen Zs who wanted to get involved with this project. And here are some, some images here. And um, I just want to give a bit of an overview with, with our findings. So what did we actually, um, you know, kind of come out of this? And again, I'm going beyond the statistics here, but just want to first of all touch upon some interesting points of the kind of the negative physical reactions. Um, so, so one kind of kind of relating to previous research, there was a sense of feeling kind of exhausted um, in VR spaces. I'm feeling frightened sometimes, um, feeling frightened of bumping into something in, in the actual physical space as well, because they were so immersed in their environment. Um, feeling overwhelmed, you know, VR is too realistic at times. Um, you know, feeling this lack of control, you know, our, um, our, our participants here, you know, they wanted to kind of um, be in control of their space uh, more so than, than being per participants. Um, the actual impact of, of the headset, that social element of, um, you know, being worried that they would leave makeup on on the rim of the headset and that it would mess up their hair, especially for London College of Fashion students. This was a, a concern that they had. Um, also, you know, the, the feeling like a, a quote, an other, you know, if other students or other participants weren't wearing a headset, they felt awkward. Um, they said that they would feel more comfortable if, you know, they would do so with their friends. So very much a social aspect here um, that we also see in, in retail. Um, and also, I mean, I, I'd be happy to send this link out, um, but this is an example of an FIA project, um, a different project from the FIA showcasing an, a VR experience. And um, in our focus group discussions, we then ended up looking at other VR experiences, um, which I'll come back to in a moment. Um, oops, let me get the next slide. There we go. Going with with the VR experiences, what was particularly kind of fascinating to us was that most of the participants said that they felt lonely when there were no other kind of avatars or, or models in that space that kind of touched upon feeling scared again. Um, but really, they didn't feel comfortable when it was just them in a VR space, despite it being, you know, beautiful and captivating. They wanted to have, again, a social aspect in that area, um, and they needed that sense of encouragement from other participants. Um, other kind of interesting findings, um, the scale of oneself as the viewer was deemed really important. So they didn't want to be seen as, you know, kind of, um, you know, kind of ant-like, um, kind of looking up at fashion products. They wanted it to be, um, you know, realistic, you know, where a handbag wasn't towering over them, but was actually at scale to who they were, um, you know, with, with their body. They wanted to understand, you know, what was their starting point? It wasn't a Enough just to kind of look down and see kind of a, a black circle as to where they're starting from, but where, um, you know, their feet, for example, they wanted to feel grounded also in a virtual space. Um, and ultimately, and I'm sure, um, and, and I know this is kind of um, relevant for other projects in the space, but there is a serious gap, even though there is an interest in, um, in XR, um, there is still a gap as to how to use some of these technologies. And these participants that we worked with, um, they, they said that they felt embarrassed even asking because there was this assumption that, you know, quote, Gen Zs um, are so technologically advanced, you know, some of them grew up gaming. Um, but again, they felt embarrassed kind of knowing more about that because um, they were deemed to be kind of experts or the expert generation in this space. Um, and also a gap in what the actual purpose was. You are connected so to audio. But oh. it can't so. Um, and so, you know, what the actual purpose was, and that is really where the problem slash opportunity lies from a fashion and retail space of making sure that that invitation to interact is clear and easy to understand. Um, again, drivers for, for XR is, is understanding that that consistency, so the consistency between a product that is being displayed within an environment. So, for example, we saw a brilliant, you know, that, that kind of um, Burberry check with the red bag um, 
you know, that needs to be in a space that makes sense. It shouldn't be in a space where, you know, the sky is pink and there's pink jellyfish. Um, that didn't make sense to the participants. They wanted something that connected with the overall um, kind of retail story um, and not feeling too limited. You know, they wanted to explore a space. They didn't want to be seen as passive. They wanted to see be seen as, as really, um, you know, proactive and, and contributing, co-creating to what the actual creative um, vision was um, of, in our case, what we created, but also in, in future for, um, for retailers. Um, so again, this desire for interaction and freedom was was really important, um, going beyond just entertainment or that fun factor, but again, um, in, an invitation for an action instead of just viewing. Um, I won't go into too much detail here just because of, of time, um, but, you know, in terms of the, the the digital um realism element you know people needed to see the textiles um with with movement they wanted to see how the textiles would be worn on a body so that jacket that we saw earlier um that wasn't enough they wanted it to be worn um by an avatar and actually um being used in a space um the reflection was lot of light was really important so those textiles that we see here for example kind of animal um leathers um were, were particularly successful because of that kind of the way the light was interacting. Um, and, uh, and yeah, you know, realism is, of course, important for that overall experience. And so, you know, what I want to kind of leave you with everybody here is, is, is the practical element, the actual managerial implications. Um, number one, that environmental relevance, um, a VR environment must complement complement or match fashion products to avoid randomness, confusion, feeling overwhelmed, or other kind of negative um, feelings of unease. Um, second of all, combating loneliness. Um, even if one has a fantastic VR experience, if you don't have that social element there, it is again seemed as negative. So adding avatars in a space um, and going beyond an environment is, is important. Third of all, again, purpose matters. Participants need to be told um, what the clear vision is, why they're contributing here. Um, I think, you know, especially, you know, today we have to go beyond cool. We have lots of cool technologies, lots of incredible creators, but it needs to be followed by an invitation for interaction um, and again, co-create the overall experience. Um, so investment should be placed in that interaction opportunity. Um, so going beyond just a product and focusing more so on the action. Um, and then, you know, this is one of those, those tricky points, but again, there is a difference in realism. So an object that looked particularly real to one participant looked almost, you know, cartoony to another. So it's interesting to see that level of, um, you know, the subjective nature of, of how we view realism. And we can't generalize, of course, across populations. Um, so, so those were for us, the kind of five key takeaways from um, from this project. And um, just to kind of wrap things up, um, looking ahead, we want to build further and understand how you know these separate XR experiences can come together um, and 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 layer storytelling. And especially um, you know for brands in the luxury space, you know, in the heritage space that you know focus on storytelling, um, they want to understand more as to you know. How can we get customers involved? How can we go beyond a, a campaign and actually bring it more personal um, to, um, to different customers? So again, it's an integration of all of these different forms from XR desktop to VR. And um, we're excited to look at different um, kind of you know, funding opportunities and work with brands in that space. So I know I went a little bit over, John, I'm sorry. Um, and, uh, but uh, I'll uh, invite any questions and uh, please uh, do feel free to reach out um, if you'd like to connect. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Nina and Lisa. That's brilliant. Um, so yeah, I'd love to um, welcome any questions. Um, so there's two ways you can do that. So either through the Q&A, there's a Q&A button you can press, you can type it in, or you can raise your hand. Um, like a good old classroom, but we can give you um, access to your, um, 
your mic and you can ask a question or make a comment, any observations on the research or any, any reflections on it in relation to your own practice, we're all welcome. Um, I've always got a question ready while people are hopefully furiously typing their question. Um, uh, so I was going to say, um, so in terms of um, fashion brands, like what, what is the thing that they're finding most interesting around technology? Are there, um, is, it, um, is it trying to reach um, people like wherever they are in, the, in life? Is it about bringing them to places? Are they more interested in, you know, in the, the big showy activation and the, the pop-up spaces? Or is it more like just straight to the consumer and where they are? Because I think that there's probably different implications for how we think about ways we might use the technology based on that. Um, well, I'll let Lisa kind of bring some of some of her insights um, with with FIA, but just to kind of kick things off. I mean, a fashion brand today is not selling garments necessarily. I mean, there's so much diversification, you know, whether it's you know going into hospitality or healthcare or media. Um, so there's never been a more important time than than you know sharing who your brand is and we have evolved as an audience from you know taking you know messaging from you know Vogue magazine and we now expect to be part of that message creation so i mean we've talked so much about you know user generated content you know with social media but now it's a step further and actually creating um you know, being part of that brand activation, that brand creation. Um, and so, you know, I, I think what's interesting for, for us as researchers is how industries are coming together, whether it's fashion and film, fashion and, um, you know, kind of publishing in order to create these new layers of storytelling. And I know, Lisa, you guys have some different examples of what you've been working on. So I'll, I'll pass it to you. Um, but yeah, just to get things going. <laughs> Yeah, no, Nina, I think you've kind of outlined it really well there. Um, certainly, brand storytelling is always at the forefront and being able to use these technologies um, to, the, to the best advantage. I think, um, to your point, we're kind of looking at whenever we're creating these digital assets, albeit you know, it might be an amazing um, environment that we've created using Unreal Game Engine um, to the actual physical... 3D um, digital garments and looking at how we can repurpose those in meaningful ways. So, for instance, it might be that you, you know, a consumer is watching um, a show. So think of like the Balenciaga Autumn Winter 24 um, catwalk show or even the Chanel show where you had these digital backdrops and you had real models walking in front. The idea that you can see that feel really, really inspired and then actually have the ability to step into that world, to actually step into that, whether that's through virtual reality and exploring that environment yourself, or being able to view those digital pieces through mixed reality or even through an AR filter. I think brands are really excited to look at how they can take advantage and use all of these to, to, you know, to help um, express the brand in the best possible way. Um, we're really excited um, by the, the launch last night, for instance, of the Snap AR glasses, where you can see, you know, in the not too far distant future that people will be wearing these AR glasses and being able to kind of layer on these this digital content into the real world. So it's these kind of things that brands are really excited um, to be testing out with us at the moment. Brilliant, thank you. There's a, a wonderful segue to a question that's been asked by Christina, which is around the Apple Vision Pro. So um, question whether you've tried it and FIA have been involved in using it and what, uh, I guess, what your thoughts are and also, yeah, what Fran's thoughts are on, I guess, the, the jump up in visual quality and that, um, that it offers. So, yes, we have been um, trying the Apple Vision Pro. Um, I think the, the graphics are good. I think the, the headset itself is still quite weighty. It's not particularly comfortable. I think, you know, the idea that you would sort of want to um, remove yourself and have that shopping experience, I think, is still, uh, for me personally, I still feel like that's a bit of a leap. Um, I think we kind of still are, like in, in this, in this um, moment where a lot of functionality that you can do through your, for your laptop and through your phone are still adequate. I think in order to kind of entice people to, get that crossover. I think one will be the reduction in the in the price because it's still 
you know, unattainable for most people. Um, and I think also just in terms of levels of comfort and how long you would want to be wearing that. Um, so certainly for me, I don't think that that is necessarily kind of a piece of technology that's going to be driving it. But I also think we need the likes of Apple to be creating these products in order to kind of push the dial and to encourage um, content creators to be able to look at what might be feasible. So, yeah, I think it's, it's really exciting for sure. Lovely. Um, so with an eye on time um, and I've got another question or I don't think we've got any hands up. I think I can see them but then shaking his head. So I'm going to um, thank you both. So Lisa Chatterton, uh, Nina Van Volken, but thank you very much for talking about your project and your work more generally as well. Um, and yeah, I uh, hope to see more of it soon. Thank you, John. Um, okay, so now um, our second project, which is also based on around from um, London College of Fashion, um, and we're welcoming um, Donatella Barbieri and uh, Ben Turnbull, who are going to introduce themselves and introduce their project. Um, so over to you both. And Donatella, well done. Well, we know we had some difficulties getting you in. You've made it. So I hope you're. I hope you're. Can, you, um, can calm. you hear me? We can hear you perfectly. That's so, brilliant. I mean, we so, can. Yeah. I was a bit I worried will, uh, we wouldn't be able to say, but we can, yeah. <laughs> we, we yeah, can, we can. I, I think you Over heard me. Back. I can't. I, 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 I think um, um, Ben is going to move the slides because I've, mm -hmm. uh, I've got other difficulties here. So, um, no thank you very much. Um, so, um, hello, I'm Donatella Barbieri and I'm reader um, uh, of Critical Costume Practices and Cultures and Lot of Body of Fashion. And hello, I am Ben Turnbull, and um, I'm a senior lecturer in performance uh, technology and design at London College of Fashion. Next slide, please. So this research is centered on the Honeywell Museum, which holds collections gathered since early 20th century, including ethnographic collections during the time of British colonial imperialism. As part of its long-term and ongoing decolonizing drive, which has seen multiple uh, repatriations um, of collected objects, it has, over the last three years, been celebrating Nigerian independence in the Nigeria at 60 exhibition in relation to continuing engagement with diasporic community in the UK, in particular in London and South London. So our research considered digital technologies um, uh, and digital humans as ways to activate and enact the meanings of cultural objects and in ethnographic collections in collaboration with artists and researchers in Nigeria and in the UK. So as well as the, the democratizing culture through access to performance, XR technologies um, here make space for vital practices and practitioners that expose critical understanding of dance and textile arts. Centered on Yoruba objects, our project frames performance as critical to social well-being. Uh, for Wale uh, Soyinka, you can see some quotes here, um, playwright and Nobel Prize for Literature, performance exists between past, present and future as a space to understand how to be human, as well as, um, as, well, as, well as to practice our interconnectedness with others, with ancestors and with the environment. Donatella, I'm just going to pause you there just because, Ben, the slide view that you shared is the presenter view, so we can see oh, it's quite small on our screen, okay. I think. Sorry to disrupt you, Donatella, in full flow there, but just so we can we can see at home exactly what you want us to see. Thank you very much. Thank you. I didn't realise that. Uh... And actually, the next slide is Ben taking over, so... Oh. Okay. It's when you have multiple screens, I think, and it. I do have two screens. Yeah. Uh, okay. So. That's slide one. Yeah. You should be. You should be able that's, to see the main view. That's perfect. Then thank you. That's it. Excellent. Thank you. Apologies for that. Right. Um, now this is the experience we created. Um, I've slotted this at the beginning, and I'll come back to this slide at the end. Uh, so that you have a chance to experience um, uh, as AR mixed reality um, experience that we've created. It's a prototype um, for the Horniman Museum, which we're going to tell you more about. Um, so this QR code will take you to it. Uh, there are some instructions here. Uh, the main one that you're going to need is that the password is Moremi. 
uh, with a capital M, so M O R E M I. Uh, but I will, we will come back to this right at the end. Uh, it's just that we didn't want to sort of dominate the um, chance for questions at the end by going through this so that you have a chance to look at it during the presentation. Um, so um, there are many project objectives with this, but the main one was to engage multiple physical, material and digital processes, exploring a multi-sensorial diasporic um, African dance uh, alongside drumming and um, and costume textiles. Uh, but we had other, um, there, there were other objectives we wanted from this project. Uh, the main one was to, to, to use this project and to use um, XR to create a, a community. Um, and this community was comprised of UAL based makers. So it wasn't just LCF, but um, we were working with practitioners across the, um, uh, across the whole university, uh, made up of makers, designers, technologists, um, and, our, um, and our industry partners. Uh, we wanted to create and share culturally specific performance and practices in a way that um, we wanted to be communal and ethical. Uh, we wanted to test volumetric capture as a means of recording a, a durational and, and multi-sensorial live performance. Um, and there's a lot within a performance that is not just about the kind of visual aesthetics, but is about the dynamic movement, um, uh, other senses that come into play, uh, which you would experience if you're directly uh, experiencing the kind of masquerade that inspires this. So the aim is to explore how to, how to capture movement and performance language um, as part of a mixed reality and XR experience, which I think actually now, I've, I've really heard a lot more about um, um, about the previous project, um, you know, it does chime with what Nina was saying about, um, you know, the movement of, of textiles, like the movement of these objects and, and, and the difference that makes to something otherwise it's a, it's a static experience. Um, and then finally is to create a prototype for uh, an experience that brings museum artifacts and collections to life in a way that is that is contemporary and has me holds meaning for diasporic communities and for our cultural partner, who was the Horniman Museum in South London for this. Um, you can see it's a real diverse team of people. There's a lot of people involved in this project uh, from the costume and making side, performance side, um, technology and volumetric capture. Um, and um, the Horniman, who was the potential performance site for this. So we made this, although you are, some of you are hopefully now experiencing um, the, um, this AR experience within your own home or possibly at work, um, it is actually designed for this space here on the right. So it's a small, um, uh, it's not a, it's it's not a big space or an important space. Really. It's a it's it's connected to the what is currently holding the Nigeria sixty exhibition, and it's a place for children to write their thoughts and reflections on on on, on the exhibits and the artifacts that they've experienced. Um, and so the aim is that the performance takes place here. Um, and what we've tried to do and started exploring is the lighting of it, which is supposed to hopefully blend in seamlessly with the physical lighting that is in this space. Um, and and then finally, um, uh, the other project partner was this was was architecture studio and this and Richard studio who um, put together um, uh, exhibits and they are sort of observers within this project and people that we're working with now much more closely on the development of this project, which we'll tell you about right at the end. Okay, no, sorry, my slides are jumping a bit. Okay, hopefully. So we're on volumetric capture um, technology. And these are just the early experiments. Um, I just wanted to say why volumetric capture. We, it was important for the project to work from a, a physical performance, a physical making point. And we kind of realized early that volumetric capture would be a really interesting way to capture textiles and dynamic movement and to work with people's existing practices. Um, uh, it was important to us to find technologies that could facilitate that. So a diverse team of performers, makers and designers who um, have that practice. We wanted to democratize the tech, sorry, democratize the technology um, and to increase accessibility. Um, and finally, we wanted the physical performance to be at the heart of it and the capture of that performance. Uh, and also we did consider ways around um, sort of using motion capture um, and animation techniques. Uh, we thought that volumetric capture itself would be an interesting way to, to, to work with that and to explore how long and how durational we, we can make this. Um, here you can see some early, so these are really early efforts. Um, we were just using, this is an iPhone, 
We managed to mm. hook up a couple of iPhones with an app called Record 3D, uh, but it does actually show you more or less analogous to how the cameras we were using work in that you've got uh, a video stream for RGB video, oh, that is me that you can see, uh, and then you um, you have this, uh, you have a depth camera. So it records, so for those of you not familiar with the process, it, it, it records depth so it can measure um, uh, the distance and how far away uh, objects are within an area in relation to where the camera is. Um, and this is using the face ID, so just the, what you use on your iPhone to wake it up, um, pay for things, two-factor authentication, that kind of thing, um, and using um, Unity. Um, at this point, I have to give a big thanks to the Fashion Innovation Agency, who did loan us um, three uh, Connect Azure cameras for this. Um, I still have two of them, uh, long story on the third one, uh, <laughs> but um, I will give them back to you. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and we started beginning testing with these cameras, which you can see on the right. So this is working with a pre-existing one of our MA students, um, testing with two Microsoft Connect cameras. And on the last one here, you can see um, a, you know, these are experiments, didn't go down this direction, but exploring kind of, working with green screen and projection mapping something that would have been much more of a kind of live experience for a group of people um okay um we went into the museum archives which was really interesting this was again we're using uh, didn't relate so much to the experience that you're seeing but um using photogrammetry for this really helps in working with archive material and archived objects it brings these to life in a way that documenting it in a 2d a flat image way um made it really helpful for the creation of the costume. Um, so capturing the sort of three dimensionality of six textures and the materials and the potential performativity um, that can be within them. Um, and it was shortly after this that we were kind of lucky enough to, to meet um, Terence Quinn, who is a PhD researcher working at Wimbledon, so one of the colleges of the new AL. Um, and this was a due to a social media post that, that Chris follows, who's emerging technology manager sort of posted. And, and at this point, kind of, we could see that the two practices really align. So it was quite fortuitous in, in, in many respects. Um, Terence and Chris were capturing small performances for um, that can be experienced as part of the Venice Biennale. And that um, you can experience that actually by going to this performance here by Tim McCren, uh, by, uh, if you go to that QR code there. So you get a sort of a, a secondary type of performance, if you like, um, and you can see more of their work there. Um, this gave us access to many more connects um, and, and to and to PC and software that otherwise um, that, that was really sort of helpful and sort of directed to um, how this project went in the end. And then at this point, I will hand back over to to Donatella. Thank you, Ben. And yes, it just uh, the Venice Biennale made me um, jump back to the wider, con wider societal and cultural concerns that can be engaged by this technology. And the ethics kaboom behind it is very important to point out that this project was underpinned by research by and with Dr. Babatunde Alan Bakari in Nigeria. Um, uh, so he uh, has he, as we discussed and, and together wrote about um, the social agency of costume in Yoruba culture. I first encountered his work in 2020 and we've been working together since. Um, uh, he remains a consultant on the further research that we will be doing. Um, and the, the important aspect is that uh, the article that we wrote uh, claimed that costume led performance is and has been fundamental to the preservation and transmission of this ancient culture, which I think is something that transfers nicely to the next slide to the in terms of transmission of culture, Ben, um, uh, because uh, uh, in bridging past, present and future, VR technology can take us onto those futures. So um, as the title of the session tells us. So, um, uh, so these, these are um, uh, so these are intended to uh, support the revitalization of African cultures um, and Western museums through engagement with, with, with a, a such performance practices. Here, masquerades, masquerade performance documented in 1950s to your left, uh, to the left of your screen, which Joel Adedeji connects to Alaringo Traveling Theatre, first documented in 1850s can also be seen enacted in the present, last summer, in Bulanji Alonji's uh, Lagos uh, photographs. So 
um, what, what is interesting in, in looking onto the future is how African um, African um, um, uh, specialists in in tele in televerse AI writing on how virtual reality can help revolutionize cultural heritage in Africa posits that through VR cultural manifestation strategies can ensure continued vitality. There is in our article a sense of um, that, that there is a fragility to this um, uh, to this cultural practices, whereas this this uh, the VR can bring back, we, 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 we can ensure a continued vitality, enabling wider engagement and the reinvention of traditional performances for the present and for the future. So in the next slide, um, uh, we um, are going to discuss a bit more our project, how we did that. So critical to our project was the coalescing with UAL students and alumni of a temporary Yoruba and Pan-African community brought together by a moving drawing drumming workshop run with percussionist Richard uh, Olatunde Baker, choreographer and dancer Fume Opeyemi and performer and composer Helen Epka. The description that accompanied the call for Yoruba and Pan-African costume and co-creators spoke of the intended use of volumetric capture towards VR performance prototype, um, which we, we which you have, have all access to. Given the creative social and cultural currency that, emer that emergent digital production processes hold alongside the focus on Yoruba culture, we attracted a group of really great co-creators. So the, the combining of the VR and the traditional really helped to get a fantastic team together. So if we don't go to the next slide. So the uh, the workshop, you can see here, tapped into relational notion of distributed agencies, which similarly to how digital performance technology entangle materiality and immateriality, informed the per per percussion-led dancing, generative of collective mark making, guided by the rhythm of Richard Olatundi, multiple traditional Yoruba drums and the African vibes of Fumi Opeyemi's movement, the three hours workshop forged a co-creative group through shared experience that was captured in chalk marks on paper, very analog, but, but useful for the next stage. So if we could then go on to the next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So such co-creative relational communities of distributed agency were perceptible in our visit to the Honima Museum, which helped direct, Ben has spoken a little bit about this in terms of how we call these textures, um, which helped direct the, um, the intended materialization of a diasporic version of Europa performance um, uh, masquerade costume. So the elements you see on the left are some of 30 um, 30 parts of a maximalist and very impactful masquerade outfit that, while transcending its components, was evidently made by many different hands, a little bit like our um, um, our production that was made by many, many hands all tightly working together. It was not unlike the example on the right, which demonstrated uh, demonstrates, as, as Bolangi Campbell notes, um, the entanglement of individual community, of past and present, of proximity and distance through textile and performance in human, non-human relating that the costume performance body can generate. Thank and then if we go on to number 14, we can talk a little bit more about, uh, oh, have we gone, oh, I think we skipped a slide. <laughs> Am I? Um, that one. Uh, yes, thank you. Lovely. Um, so if you want to mind, um, ethics of shared social and creative responsibility and energy um, of making together where um, um, were deployed through the Yoruba understanding of textile and performance as weaving communities together. So Maya, Onari, um, Rosal, Bakas, uh, Trudy and Yufe and ourselves who supported them, there were about three colleagues, um, two, my, myself and two colleagues that supported them, created a collective, a creative collective. Its, out, its outcomes included traditional forms of knotting introduced by textile artist Richard Alice Richardson, who is also the MA um, textile, um, textiles course leader at LCF. Uh, and she also supported the digital textile co-creation that emerged entirely, was informed really in a big way uh, from the mark making of the workshop and from the movement and the experience and the beats and the colors that um, uh, synesthetically were experienced in the workshop. So um, uh, patterns were developed through an actual weaving of panels as much as uh, people together, a process supported by Laura Mora Morris throughout 
having done tests with Ben, the volumetric caps are the critical collaborators. The lenses were constant consideration, as was the movement collectively experienced by um, uh, by by the group, thus extending um, uh, this creative process into social as much as technological realm. So vital situated cultural meanings, however, became evident in the final fitting with dancer Fumi Opeyemi when she tried the, co um, the constructed traditional contemporary dynamic outfit, which had intended to be a masquerader, she found herself instead being a queen warrior, <laughs> a warrior queen, an African warrior queen. The costume lacked the obligatory um, covered face of masquerade characters as the collective had deemed it too demeaning to cover uh, Fumi's face. So if we go to my last slide, I can quickly talk about Moremi. Yeah, so, Thank you. Ricasta Moremi, the 12th century mythical figure um, uh, who saved peop um, her people, by, by her Yoruba people, by going behind enemy lines um, in a protracted war. She became a relevant and current embodiment of African female power, particularly through contemporary feminist critique that you can see on the slide. As, uh, uh, as, the, current in, uh, uh, as the currency of digitized performance connecting past, present and future through volumetric capture, um, and, uh, and costume, we may it may enable a casting and an amplifying of pertinent oral tradition and stories, enabling a decolonizing Western ethnographic museums such as the Horniman, as well as herself working with them to tell new stories about Africa, myth and women. And that's my final words on the matter. And I hand over to Ben. I'm a bit conscious of time and I want to leave some time for questions at the end. So I will fly through this, I promise. Um, so we this this took place in a in a pop up volumetric capture studio. So it wasn't a facility that we went to, but we set everything else um, uh, up for this um, ourselves with Terry and with Chris. Um, I just want to say something about the process, if there's some understanding there. It's um, volumetric capture is capturing everything within a volume. So around here, are an array of um, eight in the end cap uh, cameras uh, capturing. Uh, everything within actually just outside that grey circle. So it was about 2.8 metres in diameter and it was capturing quite a fast moving uh, performance dance and moving textiles, as well as the percussion and drumming, which was beautifully composed and played live by um, Helen Apega, who you can just about see in the background there. Um, and for those that I'm sure would be interested in this, like the, um, this is the setup we use. So we used eight of the connected zero uh, spatial cameras, um, which is RGB video and uh, depth sensors. Um, one piece, so that's streaming into one PC running the depth kit, which um, calibrates the cameras, capture performance video and geometry. There's a lot I could say about that process of using depth kit, but we'll have to leave that one for another time. Uh, mm -hmm. Ambient light, so it captures everything within the volume, including how we were using it, the lighting within the space. Um, the audio I've already mentioned, so we capture that and edit it into the video stream. And then we used AI, so we used Topaz as a solution to, um, we approach this and, and what Donatella was saying was designing a costume around this notion of knowing that there will be digital artifacts. So knowing about um, uh, the errors that would creep through this process. So it was quite an interesting kind of reflexive way of working where we were creating materials out of physical processes that were then digitally printed and then using the cameras to record those, which then fed back into the design process. Um, that being said, uh, at times there was maybe a little too many sort of digital artifacts and actually using AI to improve the video streams is quite an interesting way of improving and a cheap way of improving visual quality without having to go to a capture a different solution, which would be much, much more expensive. Um, the end product we uploaded to a content delivery network and we streamed that into the eighth wall platform, which is probably best known. It's now called Niantic Studio, but probably best known as the creators of the game Pokemon Go. Um, mm -hmm. That's a layout there. And then um, just finally, some, some videos that show this. This shows the streaming from the video textures and the Azures themselves. You can see eight, one for each camera, capturing the performance on the left. Um, in the middle, I talked a bit about the... It, it's interesting to play about scale and performance. Um, and, um, 
uh, and using different venues and uh, avenues for performance in terms of creating this, even though, as I mentioned earlier, it, the, for the ideal for the prototype was it for being for a specific place in the Horniman Museum. And then the video on the right says so the process of capture, a volumetric capture uh, within the depth kit studio. And, um, and, and you can see um, Fumi's performance in the studio there as well. And then the last slide um, is, um, um, Donatella referred to um, a reference to Soyinka and about performance of the past, present and future. And I suppose I wanted to wrap that up with that a little bit as well. And that this was, you know, a process that started with me and Donatella working together on, um, and before for Donatella, but um, I suppose where I came in when we were um, working with projection mapping and materials in a physical sense in, in, in Prague um, earlier this, no, sorry, last year. Um, and, and now this project has been developed further um, in, as into a, a live performance that will take place um, as part of Horniman late uh, next year in March. And then these are our contact details. If you want to quickly um, say hello, um, that's um, uh, Donatella's email, and that's mine down there. And uh, I'll leave on this slide just so if you, when I was flying through it earlier, you didn't get a chance to um, access the QR code. And thank you very much. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, that was really great, and it's great to hear about you know, the combination of the, um, the technical stuff and, and and how you put it together with the story about how you work with the creative community that you brought together that was really lovely um i think we've got time for maybe one question maybe two let's see so we've got um, a question in the in the q a box um so it says great research project thank you for sharing it um the question is is there a specific area or aspect of your research that you wish you had the opportunity to explore more deeply or perhaps plan to in the future and that's a pretty great question because i think you've got plans to extend the research in place yes yes um, go first you want you want me i'll go first or, yes okay uh so um yeah i mean there's lots of aspects of it um i mean one i suppose uh you know i always think the people are the most important and and i guess it is a, it's a it's an opportunity to develop the community aspect of that further like to keep you know we started out with this project and then we get to carry that on and to work further on the project with the Horniman. in terms of for me aspects of capture um yeah that we want to do it differently with the project we carry on with the Horniman. so this is more um this would be a mixed reality live performance so um there would be i'm not going to tell too much about it right now but there will be um there will be physical aspects of the performance and there will be mixed reality aspects for the performance. Um, so digital layers to that. Um, and that will be experienced um, using headsets and pass through. So actually not with the Apple Vision Pro, but I guess a similar, um, that, that experience of um, uh, a similar description of that spatial video, but with um, physical aspects to what would be um, a, a live performance is how, um, and, and, and and where those two meet is where I'm really interested in, you know, the physical and, and, and the digital. Donatella, did you have anything? I'm sure you've got things you'd want to Yeah, add. no, I mean, lots and lots of things, but but I think the fact that we um, are actually making it part of the next exploration, the ethical aspects of this, and um, as you probably noticed holding the holding the phone and holding the person in your space, that uh, the dancer whom in your space, he feels like you've got a lot of power. And, and we're interested in how we're interested in how we might um, uh, gain insights and guidelines because there isn't enough out there uh, that directly addresses virtual production that directly um, of these types that captures the body volumetric captures of different types even the word capture in a sense is a colonial word so it's it's something that we've got to, we've begun to investigate and involve a, a wide number of um, uh, of c people across UAL mostly, so that's um, that's the thing that the area that I I um, I'm, I'm also focusing on as well as and also I know Ben is really interested in this, so we we have two outcomes. Yeah, I mean there's other I mean there's lots of things and also about ownership of digital assets and and, and how that is credited with these kinds of experiences and immersive experiences and um, for me you know there's there's things around sort of blockchain and decentralized technologies that I think is quite interesting there, quite interesting work going on there in terms of um, attributing, you know, ownership to a performance or, or to, or, or, 
to anything you know a 3d model uh, an idea you know how you do that is is something that i'm quite interested and it's, in it's a co-creative is the co-creative aspect of it is really yeah, important yeah you have this and, really important and, to yeah. co-create yeah, uh, so. and also i think i'm just to pick oh, this is a really good question but uh <laughs> with the it, to go back that you know obviously once it's out there you can use that and experience that in whatever way you want but actually you know with i think where we're going forward is the opportunity to, to direct it more to 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 sort of decide uh, to to have that artistic approach to okay well what do we want an audience to experience i mean not creating something and sort of throwing it out there in the world even though i'm saying that with the caveat that you know it's a kind of a week because it was a prototype for a place that we still haven't actually done it in in terms of like it done experience moremi in that room that i showed you in in the horniman museum um rather than it being something that's just experienced by people wherever they happen to be um and yeah i mean this is more just a comment from me i suppose to to, clo to close oh. off the conversation but the it seems to me the potential for that digital experience whether it's to be experienced in a specific place and time um, or whether it could be experienced like um, we've shared with the audience here, like wherever you be, um, that it is digital is not in the way of it being a system. And so it can always be in the museum and it can be you know, used regularly or it can be you know, just a, a part of how the museum is, is presenting uh, its, its archive and stories of, the, of, of the cultures that it, it holds so that's really interesting to me is that although it's digital it is in some ways more persistent than particularly in exhibition settings where you know, things change over time so yeah. that's really interesting um i'm gonna um we're just probably about a time now so um we don't have any additional questions um there's a couple of dan, dan will capture them but there's a um helena peg has um mentioned um she's just a wonderful project and i think she Really enjoyed working with you and one of your colleagues at UALs dropped you a message and if you haven't seen it then i'll get it to you um I but yeah I, I think i end the slideshow because you need to you, do your parish notices so. yeah you can you can <laughs> end the slideshow. go for it um let me i'll just let them open okay is that has that you stop sharing your screen uh oh no yeah okay brilliant and uh, yeah so very quickly for me just to um finish the seminar off my screen sharing is paused. Why is that? I don't seem to be able to share my screen. Don't worry, I'm going to say my parish notices out loud. Um, oh, I see. Maybe that works. There we go. Um, can you see a purple screen, everyone? I think you can. Yeah? Yes. Yes. Brilliant. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so this, so two parish notices very quickly. So we have um, another seminar coming up. So. Um, it's on the 16th of October at 2 p.m. And it's um, another of the UAL um, projects from our first round of Exile Networks projects. Um, and that's called Real-Time Made in Code um, and is exploring even deeper, um, uh, a highly realistic um, cloth and garment rendering um, for a variety of applications. So that'd be really interesting. Um, we're up in Dundee um, uh, uh, co-hosting a, a roadshow event with Abertay University on the 22nd of October. So if you're based in Scotland or to come up, um, you'll be more than welcome and uh, you'll be able to register for that on the Exxon Network Press website. Um, and then just finally over the next sort of coming few weeks, there'll be um, a, a bunch of projects announced that would have just been funded and just in the process of setting up. So there's another wave of really interesting R&D that, you know, I think touches on all our interests. Um, coming up so yeah um, check out the website and the, the you know the usual social media things um, so that's me done I'm just going to end by one more um, thanks for our four contributors today um, you know re really beautiful um, projects um, and I wish uh, you all the best with those as you take them forward thank you very much for your time today and thank you for everyone um, for joining us um, as well all right <laughs>